I'd like to welcome everybody to um, this year's Mini Distinguished Lecture in Ethics and Responsibility. My name is Fiona Doyle and I'm the Executive Associate Dean in Engineering and it's my pleasure to be hosting this event. Um, this is a very, very exciting um, event every year and um, we're delighted that this year we're hosting a talk by Dale Doherty, who's the founder and CEO of Maker Media. Before we get going on the um, talk itself, I'd, my first very pleasant duty is to thank our student co-sponsors for this event. And um, we have here helping us out a new club that's just formed this year, um, 3DMC, which stands for the 3D Modeling Club of UC Berkeley. And the relationship between the 3D Modeling Club and um, the maker talk, uh, maker theme of the talk is obvious. So thank you, 3DMC. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank um, our good friends Warren and Marjorie Minna, who provided a generous gift to the college to support the teaching and study of engineering ethics and responsibility here at Berkeley. Um, and this lecture is one of the many results of their generosity. Um, we're so grateful to them. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge their granddaughter, Mara, who's in civil and environmental engineering. Mara, uh, I, know you, I know you're here somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. So let's, let's all applaud Mara so she can take the floor. <laughs> now, um, the whole um, theme of ethics and professional responsibility has been gaining such support um, around the college that this year um, it was decided that um, the Minna Lecture could be the foundation of an entire week of festivities devoted to ethics and professional responsibility. So we're drawing to a conclusion the Engineering Ethics Week. Um, one of the highlights of the week was a video competition um, that challenged our students to identify an ethical issue, explore all sides of the issue, and then propose ways of addressing it. And the contest was modeled after the National Academy of Engineering's Ethics Video Challenge. So um, before we get to the lecture, I kind of feel like I'm doing the Academy Awards here because um, another of my pleasant tasks is announcing the winning entries of the video contest um, as selected by our faculty screening committee. So um, I'm going to be starting with our second place winners. So um, those um, students are Josh Stroud, Michael Signorotti, and Ming Shi Sheng for their entry, The Challenger Explosion, a Case Study. Um, are they here? Uh, okay. <laughs> and they will receive a prize of $450. Uh, it's the same. All right. So. <laughs> For those of you who saw the notices and didn't submit anything, just keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, don't walk by those things again. And so um, we can now announce the winners of the 2014 video contest. Um, Alexandre Chong, uh, Chong, Jody Howard, and Brittany Duquette win for their entry, The Ethical Dilemma of GMOs. Um, and the first place, standing comes with a prize of $575 to be split among the contestants. Do we have the team? Okay, please stand. <laughs> and as a bonus for the talk, we're going to have a little short, and so the short is going to be the winning video. We hear the term GMO tossed around a lot these days. But what does it actually mean? 
GMO is short for genetically modified organisms, which are plants or animals created through the genetic engineering of gene splicing techniques. The process begins by first obtaining a specific desired gene. Usually, this gene is then altered for better function or expression in the host organism. Next, it is combined with other genetic elements and introduced into a second organism, the host, at which point it's known as a transgene. GMOs are surrounded by much controversy and scientific debate. Before we explore both sides of the issue, it is important to consider the six fundamental canons that engineers must abide by. First, an engineer must hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. What does all this mean in the context of genetically modified organisms? Well, in order to reach a conclusion about this ethical dilemma, we must first begin by examining the pros and cons behind this feat of genetic engineering. Increase in agricultural productivity. In the case of genetically modified foods, there are potential benefits to agricultural productivity through the development of crops more resistant to pests, disease, and severe weather. Designing pest and disease resistant crops also decreases human and environmental exposure to chemicals and toxins. Improved productivity could result in more food from less land. Enhancement of food products. Genetic engineering can be used to modify food products in several beneficial ways. For instance, it could result in the blockage of genes associated with allergies, such as the potentially fatal protein found in peanuts. GMOs can also take the form of healthier foods. This has been done with golden rice, which has elevated levels of vitamin A. Additionally, engineering has allowed for the longer shelf life of fruits and vegetables. Widespread vaccination. Genetic engineering can be used to develop pharmaceuticals and vaccines in plants, decreasing the risk of adverse reactions and enabling faster vaccination of large populations. For instance, by incorporating a human protein into bananas, potatoes, and other fruits, researchers have been able to successfully create edible vaccines for hepatitis B, cholera, and rotavirus. Alternative energy sources. Another recent transgenic endeavor, known as the Glowing Plant Project, incorporated a gene from a firefly into a houseplant, creating plants that display a soft illumination in the darkness. One of the proposed goals is to create trees that could illuminate streets and pathways, thereby saving energy and reducing our dependence upon limited energy resources. Industrial and medical operations. One innovation is BioSteel, a high-strength, resilient silk product created by inserting the genes of a silk-spinning spider into the genome of a ghost egg prior to fertilization. There also exists the process of xenotransplantation, which is the transplantation of living tissues or organs from one species to another. This is often seen as a potential way to alleviate the shortage of human hearts and kidneys. Elusive labeling breeds distrust. To date, the Federal Food and Drug Administration has not required labeling that indicates a product has been genetically altered. This means that GMOs have been on the market for almost a decade without U.S. consumers being alerted to their presence. This secretiveness has made consumers skeptical of reassurances that genetic modifications are safe. Negative environmental impact. Since plants are not self-contained organisms, there is the danger that genes may escape and find their way into other species. This would cause much devastation if, for instance, herbicide-resistant genes found their way into weeds. Other negative environmental impacts are the risk to birds, insects, and other species that come into contact with genetically modified plants. Unintentional public harm. The result is the potential that allergy-reducing genes will be inserted into unrelated foodstuffs. Since genetically modified foods are not labeled, a person could suffer a potentially fatal allergic reaction. Support of large corporations. Small-scale farmers have reason to fear the negative impacts of a market dominated by a few powerful seed companies, such as Monsanto. Some are concerned that big corporations may use biotechnology to push others out of the market. The final source of distress is the politics and economics of allowing companies to essentially own organisms and potentially have a stranglehold on our food production. Questionable health effects. Several other countries, such as Australia, Japan, and the European Union, there are significant restrictions or outright bans on the production of GMOs because they are not considered proven safe. In the US, on the other hand, the FDA approved commercial production of GMOs is based on studies conducted by the companies who created them and profit from their sale. I feel that GMOs should be incorporated into everyday life, but only in the context of a specifically controlled setting. There should be strict regulations as to where genetically modified crops cannot be grown. It's also extremely important for the U.S. to label any products that contain GMOs. The public should be given the choice to avoid these products if desired. This also serves to place consumer needs over that of large companies. Additionally, much more research should be done on the long-term effects of modified foods. With these responsible limitations in place, I feel that the U.S. can safely explore all of the incredible applications that genetic engineering has to offer.
fantastic. Congratulations. Um, the winning entries are going to be posted on the college website. So that certainly went by pretty fast. And I'm sure some of you will want to go and see it again. Um, but congratulations to our winners. Um, you know, we've got students who participate in video contests. We've got students who help out with events. Um, those of you who aren't actually in the college um, should know that we've got an amazing number of students who are incredibly involved in not just their studies, but also in a host of um, various extracurricular ideas um, and, and uh, activities. Um, they're particularly um, involved in um, some of the activities that um, we're going to be hearing about in this talk. Um, but for those of you who want to know more about what our students are doing, um, I'd extend a warm invitation to attend Cal Day on Saturday. Um, the, this is Berkeley's annual open house, and as usual, College of Engineering has a broad array of events, lectures, displays, and um, student groups will be showing some of their fun things. So get a good taste of some of the other things that are going on here. But now it's my pleasure to introduce today's MINA lecturer, Dale Doherty. Um, Dale is the founding, um, founder and CEO of Media, Maker Media, which is based here in the Bay Area. Um, Maker Me Me Media publishes Make Magazine, um, which launched in 2005 and also puts on annually the Maker Fair, which was first held in the Bay Area in 2006. Both Make and Make a Fair have been catalysts for a worldwide maker movement that's transforming industry and innovation, hands-on learning in schools, and the daily lives of makers in the community. As Dale sees it, everyone is a maker capable of integrating creative skills with um, technical abilities. Dale was a co-founder of O'Reilly Media, where he was the first editor of their computing trade books. And he developed GNN in 1993, which was the first commercial website for um, those of us who are old enough to remember life before commercial websites. Um, just think how things have changed in um, 21 years. Um, he coined the term um, Web 2.0 in 1993. Um, Make Magazine started at O'Reilly Media and then spun out its own company um, in January 2013. Without further ado, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dale Doherty. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I should start out by saying I am not an engineer, um, and uh, so uh, take, take that uh, as a caveat for, for this presentation. But I, I won't be teaching you engi any engineering in this talk. Um, you know, I, uh, in, in 2011, gave a talk in Detroit, and preparing for it, I came up with this idea. I've been thinking about, uh, are some of us makers? Is it just a few of us that, that can make things, or that we're perhaps disposed genetically to make things? And, and I thought, without necessarily having any proof, <laughs> that I would just say that we're all makers, and that it was important to say that. And so I, I, I expressed it in this TED Talk, and uh, uh, it's actually seemed to go over pretty well. And, 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 and I think partly what I was trying to get at is it's, it's almost like saying we, we, each of us are born with the potential to do something. And if we're often given the opportunity, we develop that potential. If we don't recognize it in ourselves or see it, um, uh, we fail to develop that. But when I, when I say something like, uh, all of us are makers, particularly in an engineering audience, you know, I, I'll get sort of two uh, different responses. One, I, I'll get the kind I like, which is sort of an affirmation. I am a maker. I love to make things. I've always made things. It's what I do. The second one is, is my least favorite. It's, 
I'm an engineer. I'm not a maker. I'm a professional. Makers are amateurs. And, um, and I always kind of step back and, and just listen. And, and um, I've actually heard that at the National Academy of Engineering, for instance. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I actually feel like the, the promise that we're all makers uh, will carry the day here. Um, but I really don't want to ar argue too much about whether we're professionals or uh, amateurs here. I'm getting at the idea that, that makers, many of whom are amateurs, love to make things, um, have a wide variety of skills and talents, and they undertake interesting, even cool projects, and they like hanging out with each other. I want people to identify as producers, not just consumers. And I want them to know that there are new tools for making things which make it easier to make things. And therefore, more and more people are capable of becoming makers. Uh, and I believe they will do so, especially if they enjoy it. Making, though, I think um, the most important thing, and I, especially in, in this audience, making is an adventure. And I'm, I put up there David Lang, who wrote this wonderful book for us called Zero to Maker. Um, who, he was someone who had no skills as a maker, but walked into a tech shop in San Francisco, saw what was going on there, and said, this is what I want to do. I don't want a life in a cubicle. I want to learn how to make things. And he and his uh, uh, co-founder started um, Open ROV uh, to make underwater uh, robotic vehicles. But ultimately, I, I think today what I'd like to talk about is that I hope each of you will consider uh, the adventure of making um, and, and that it should be what we want out of our lives, not just jobs, but adventures. It's not what you do, but the experience of what you do matters. I thought, so um, as not to disappoint my sponsors, the 3D Modeling Club, um, that I will try to talk, tie this to 3D printing eventually, but I'm, I'm going to start in a different place. But let me ask you this. What year was the first patent for 3D printing issued? Does anyone know? Was it? After 2000 or before 2000? Before. Before. Before 1995 or after 1995? Yeah, I, I, I'll narrow it down. It's 1985 or, or 1986. Interestingly, it's the same year that the laser printer was patented and brought to market. These two devices actually have a lot in common. And I'm going to sort of go through some personal history and a little bit of uh, 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 technology history here, um, and, and and go through, um, you know, as a way of explaining this. The laser printer allowed creatives, usually graphic artists, to create something on a computer and print it in high fidelity. It brought to computers creative people for really the first time. It it, it gave a new use to computers, which. A company out of Cooper, uh, uh, Mountain View or Cupertino, uh, Apple Computer was just coming to be. And it was actually one of the big reasons their computers sold. Creatives um, could, could use tools for, for like PageMaker here to create new things um, and, and marrying layout and topography together. But not only experienced graphic artists use these tools. Others with little background or expertise to use them too, amateurs. And many of them created awful newsletters and ghastly brochures if looked at from a design point of view. However, from a DIY point of view, they did something that was empowering and enabling. They were able to do something they didn't think they were capable of doing. And that is one of the roles that technology um, offers us here. I was a writer who learned how to use tools not like PageMaker, but actually a set of tools for text processing that were created by Bell Labs. Uh, uh, um, researchers of Bell Labs uh, created them to publish their own research. Tim O'Reilly and I started 
uh, um, using them to create computer manuals. And we wrote a book called Unix Text Processing, how to process uh, and, and you know, basically format text and use what was then called the TROF system to do that. It was, I say it only because I was a, I was a writer, not a, not a programmer, not a technical person, but we learned this system and used it uh, well enough to be able to, to, to write a book with it. But we wrote manuals for computer companies, but eventually I wanted to, to begin producing our own books. And our very first books were humble little brown covers with about 100 pages. We called them nutshell handbooks. They had compelling titles like reading and writing term cap entries, um, <laughs> learning the VI editor, and one that would come back around in a different way called managing projects with make. These were small books uh, on uh, topics in Unix, and, um, and all of them were, were, even Unix was fairly obscure at that time. Well, one day we went to a copy shop and printed off a couple hundred uh, of these books. And we went to a trade show called Unix Expo in New York City, and we got a booth and set up a table. And this was a really reasonably large computer show, you know, full of companies selling uh, computer systems. These weren't PCs. They was, we were sort of uh, systems that a company would buy. And, you know, a couple people standing there offering books for sale... Uh, kind of stood out on one hand because we weren't selling computers, but mostly it was fairly insignificant. That's obviously, I'm on the right, it's Tim O'Reilly on the left, and my wife Nancy is in the middle there. And this was probably 1985, the same year as the, um, the laser printer. But it was the best of times, in a way. It was our adventure, just getting started. We had... Uh, we put out books. We had buyers. They, they gave us about $5 a book. And we left the show with a wad of $5, $10, and $20 bills in our pocket and went out and got dinner and went to a Broadway show in New York City. It was, it was the start of O'Reilly Media as a technical book publisher and, as I said, our own adventure. We wrote some of the early books ourselves. Um, this was Set in Arc, which... which uh, um, wrote, and you can kind of see we began replacing, uh, we came up with an idea, our, our artist Edie Freeman came up with the idea of using Dover uh, uh, animals on the cover, and uh, that became sort of the signature of O'Reilly books. But something else was happening at trade shows that I, I kind of want to mention here. While we were there selling books and, and talking to people, we got to know those people. We got to know the people that were buying these books. And they would tell us about themselves. And, you know, uh, they would tell us about subjects that they were interested in, things that were difficult for them to learn. Now, Tim and I basically didn't understand anything they were saying. We were, Tim is a classics major, I was an English major. Somehow we managed to write these technical books um, by talking to other people. I had no computer training. We were both self-taught in Unix and these other systems. But, but we learned we could help others um, who knew a lot more than us. And eventually we replaced ourselves as authors of these books by finding, by talking to people, that there were lots of people who wanted to contribute, lots of people who wanted to author a book. And one of the points of my talk today is interacting in person with customers. Ours were programmers, administrators, and others. It wasn't just a matter of finding out what books to write. It was finding out more about the people we worked for. They were people we liked, who had deep knowledge and fascinating hobbies, and they could talk about a dozen other things besides their day jobs. Sure, they were a little weird and geeky, but the more you interacted with them, the more you saw yourself as similar to them. For me, geek wasn't a pejorative or exclusionary label for a kind of outcast, but something that anyone could be or become. It was what you thought and how you thought and what you kind of liked to do. And my friend Rob Faludi uh, last year gave a talk at our conference titled Liking Your Guests, and he found a book written by a person who had designed Disneyland, and a piece of advice he offered to other designers was, liking the guests is the key to everything we do. And, and I, I thought that just 
struck a chord with me about the kind of work I had done and the kind of development we had was it's not just enough to have customers, but to actually like them, enjoy them, want to you know, understand them like family, like guests, um, it, it, it is really important. And if you think about it, when guests come to your home, you try to do something special for them. You try to treat them as um, in, in, a, in, a, in perhaps even a better way than you treat your family. <laughs> so having a laser printer gave us new ways to make books, which we were able to sell, and which gave us customers who became a kind of community that not only read and recommended our books, but wanted to become authors of those books. But also, they began to tell us, or not necessarily in words, but to show us and identify trends that were happening. Um, and, you know, for one reason or another, I and Tim stumbled upon things like the uh, Internet and the World Wide Web very early. Um, uh, you know, I, I actually found a, a Berkeley student in 1992 that uh, created the, ended up creating the first graphical web browser. His name is Pei Wei, and we end up working together uh, and building GNN, which is the first commercial browser that we launched in 1993. It was about, again, it was like new tools for creative expression, a new way to reach people, a new way to communicate with people. But it was also a community of people who were producing the web. A second trend was that free software became open source, and we got involved through, through that transition. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But the basic ideas of this were defined by Eric uh, Raymond in the Cathedral and the Bazaar, contrasting sort of top-down cathedral-style development with distributed or bizarre methods of development. One of the ways you serve a community actually is to convene them, is to bring them together. And events became an important way that O'Reilly uh, uh, um, reached people and connected to them. Our, our first conference was, was on the Perl programming language. The, um, I remember the icon was the, uh, uh, the Republic, uh, People's, People's Republic of Perl or something like that. But, um, you know, a lot of discussion was not about the language, it was not about programming, but it was about the community, it was about open source. Many times these were people who knew each other online but had never met each other in person. And it was very powerful to do that. Out of that, um, well, just in the time, I think, uh, I began uh, developing a series of books from hacks. And what I wanted to do was take the experience of hackers, things that they knew, and, and help other people learn from them. A hack to me was a non-obvious solution to an interesting problem. And initially, our first books were Google hacks and Excel hacks and just ha the sort of nooks and crannies of, of clever ways of doing things. And then I published a book on TiVo hacks. And, it was the first book on hardware and this idea of hacking hardware, you know, opening a TiVo, replacing it with a hard drive. Geeks were really enthusiastic about uh, TiVo because it had Linux inside and they could make it do what they wanted to do. And so that actually set me in a direction that ended up becoming Make Magazine. Um, but before I, I get there, this was another um, idea from ha both hacking and from open source that came together in this phrase from Eric Raymond that he explained the, the origin of open source projects as people scratching their own itch. And if you haven't heard that phrase, um, it, it actually is a little baffling. Um, uh, uh, one hand, it's obvious to think of people uh, having their own personal needs and doing that. But sometimes we have grander visions of what open source is about or what uh, why people do things. And Eric, I think, made a really important point is they have their own problem to solve and they want to spend time solving it. It just happens to turn out in a lot of cases that the problem you solve for yourself is someone else's problem as well. And it begins to multiply and partially because of the internet, uh, it propagates. So instead of solving a vaguely defined problem for someone else, you were solving a problem for yourself, and it was a, enough of an itch for you to start scratching it. So when I started uh, Make Magazine, um, you know, I wanted to take the idea of solving problems to really 
you know, what are interesting projects? What are things you could do uh, with technology? This is sort of an early whiteboard. You know, we were looking at, you know, uh, sort of making your own devices, making your own gadgets. And um, I began uh, working with designers and looking at, you know, different ways. Uh, um, actually, I was going to call Make Magazine Hacks because uh, I thought, First of all, I really like the idea of hacking the world uh, and not just hacking software. Um, I remember saying to my kids, I'm going to do a magazine called Hacks. And they go, huh? And they just didn't get it. And so I, I spent time thinking you know, and came up with, with Make a, as a difference. But um, something I did with Make um, goes back to what I meant about the trade shows. Uh, you might say I created a verbal prototype. I began talking to people about Make and what it was and what it might do. And what I found is that it didn't take much to trigger a very personal response in people. Soon a person would say to me, you should meet my brother, or they would tell me about things they were doing themselves. They talked about projects, and they, I began to see that this was a form of play for people. Um, it, was, it was how they got to do what they do. And we use words like innovation, and sometimes it's like one of those big words that sits up there and you're like, well, what is innovation? How do people innovate? And how do they get there? And one of the things I realized during this period of studying it was they play. People play. They take things apart. They put things back together. They try different things. And they don't know where they're going or why. But something through that immersion of play Something like an idea will occur to them of how to improve something or where to take it. And so I set off make not to be about, say, business, but to be about that sort of personal space you create to play. To play. Now, um, that was our very first issue, and it's actually uh, uh, Chris Benton, uh, was a, uh, just recently retired as a UC Berkeley professor of architecture. And Chris had begun playing with kites, kite aerial photography, to take pictures of buildings from different angles. He wanted to see what buildings look like from, the, from um, say, 250 feet. You know, if you look straight down from a plane, you're, you're looking at the top of a building. He wanted to see the angular nature of buildings. And I just thought it, would, it was sort of this wonderful, playful application. He later on went to become really a gallery artist, taking these kind of photos of the coastline and elsewhere. And in my first editorial, I, I kind of uh, you know, laid out, we're going to call our readers makers. I said that ma more than mere consumers of technology, we are makers adapting technology to our needs and integrating into our lives. Some of us are born makers, and others like me become makers almost without realizing it. What I did see, though, was that makers were enthusiasts. And it, wasn't an, it, it was a, it's sort of a rare quality. Um, and that's Rob Gisbert, uh, um, who actually I'll mention later in, in some of the, the MakerBot stories. I also saw it as something connected to the past, to a tradition of making. Um, you know, who wouldn't want to build that cart even today? It's, it looks fun. But, you know, scientists on the brink of hell, I don't know what that is about, you know? <laughs> but interestingly, you know, this is 1961. Make your own printed circuits. Look at that article. I, and I found this later. But there we are. We actually published the article. It was the same process, you know, that they talked about back here. We did it again, and it's still a good way to do it. Uh, it hasn't changed. And one of the insights I have is a lot of making almost uh, is not dependent on, on the era you live in. It, it, it spans uh, technologies and times. But it, increasingly, I saw this as a new wave of creatives using technology, computer technology, but using 3D printers and all kinds of things, but even hand tools and glue and, and, and things of that nature. The personal fabrication was, was enabling us to make almost anything, that any idea you had could be made real, and that you could make one of something. You didn't have to justify a complete run of thousands or millions of something. You could do just one. And I think this is the other part, that amateurs and pros really are using the same tools. Whether you're talking about music or 3D printing, this mattered um, into the world we were getting into. So um, 
the maker community as a source of innovation was applying open source to hardware. It was rap, rap, uh, doing rapid prototyping and new ideas. And the internet allowed that expertise to be shared um, regardless of who you were or where and, and learn those practices. An important book I just want to mention quickly is Democratizing Innovation by Eric Von Hippel. And I think the, the case study, in fact, I'm going to show you demonstrates this. But his point is like we tend to think innovation comes from R&D centers at large companies or even academia. He makes the point that users drive innovation, passionate users particularly. And he uses examples from extreme sports, like someone uh, that wants to kayak a certain kind of uh, river creates their own kayak and then finds other people who are interested in, in buying that kayak and goes into business to make that. Well, I'm going to use this to sell for kind of my own personal view of, of 3D printing. Back in 2007, uh, I hired uh, uh, then an art teacher from Seattle named Bree Pettis. And he came to do uh, videos for us called Weekend Projects. Bree was enthusiastic. He was a self-taught, uh, avid learner, um, uh, really just had a natural way on camera. Um, and, and he just dove into things. Originally, he just explored Seattle, finding people who were making things, documenting, talking to them. But eventually, as in this in 2007, I just found, you know, he got into building early 3D printers. This was a RepRap. And RepRap was then an open source model, uh, comes out of England. Uh, very difficult to build, but um, he dove in, into doing that. Eventually, he left working for me, moved to New York, and was part of uh, 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 setting up one of the early hacker spaces called NYC Resistor in a really cramped space in an office uh, building in Brooklyn. But that's where uh, what became MakerBot came to be, um, the, and the, the original sort of cupcake printer. We published this in 2010 in magazine. And these are the three founders, Adam, and Zach Smith and, and Bree Pettis. Um, and you know, they had their goal really was to build a 3D printer that they could use. Um, and they started out refining a kit, which became the cupcake, because it was too hard using the rep wrap. They were spending too much time. They kind of rightly saw that nobody was going to uh, build 3D printers if it took this long. So they simply wanted to improve on that process and then. Um, gradually and gradually, it got bigger and, and better. And, you know, it, it went through various stages, and uh, they began to uh, build, um, eventually, uh, a model that, um, you know, was ar already assembled. And someone like Zach went off, actually, to China to s understand could they manufacture this more cheaply, because even though they were making it with laser cutters, they knew that they needed better methods of production to lower the cost. And lowering the cost would make it possible for more people to use 3D printers. Now, something that also drove them was not hardware. It was a community. And Brie was great at organizing that community and, and uh, making, uh, making uh, the whole project open to it. Rob, who I mentioned earlier, was a software guy, not a hardware guy. He looked at the drivers and how they were written for MakerBot, and he said, those are terrible. I could write better drivers. And he did. And he contributed them to the project. And so MakerBot really was an open source company from the beginning. But as they became more successful, as the 3D printer market heated up, more competition came into the market. And, and Bree began to retreat from being an open source company. Um, he, in an open source hardware, somebody said, we've been running MakerBot as all out open. One of the downsides is we have people who don't respect the spoken and unspoken rules of open source. And we've had companies carbon copy clone us. Now we're changing. We're going to be as open as we can. And he wasn't particularly clear to people what he would be open what would be open and what would be closed. But they began closing off some of their software. And I'm not saying this, uh, this is, uh, almost is an interesting in your uh, discussion of ethics this week. It, one of the things that I think we could raise this on is, is that when you change the rules for a community, um, 
the community will largely turn against you. Um, when you want their contributions and then you say they're ours and, they, and you can't have them back, that, that is changing the rules. Um, but MakerBot and Bree went on to do quite well despite that. There's, um, he lost his co-founders. Um, they dismissed a lot of people in the company, hired new ones. Uh, Bree did very well. He was on the cover of magazines. He was featured in, in, in ads. And then um, sold the company to Stratasys uh, last year, 2012, or you know, no, last year, for uh, you know over 500 million dollars. And you know, it's a great business story that you hear. Hey, hey, an art teacher from Seattle, you know, who's doing videos, gets into 3D printing, and he and a group of of, of friends uh, and hackers um, uh, build this. And it is a great story. Um, it's a great adventure. He didn't know quite what he was getting into, um, but um, and he's he's uh, he's doing well. He's a, he's a, he's a good human being, but you're faced with a lot of tough decisions as you 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 go through here. And I'm going to just show you uh, quickly. Um, you know, I, I'm going to say I've skipped this. There's a there's a, a video called uh, a documentary was released at South by Southwest. And it's about this early birth of, of 3D printing and MakerBot. And I don't think um, MakerBot particularly likes the film, so it'll kind of tell you what the point of view is. But it's called Print the Legend. And um, uh, it, it is kind of a, a fascinating insight into, into how this all comes about. You know, we began to see lots more 3D printers. And, um, uh, you know, Maker Fair uh, has become, you know, kind of filled with all kinds of 3D printing things, and, and I, I kind of wanted to just point this, this is one of my favorite pictures from New York Maker Fair, and this, this is a, a tiny dollhouse chair, right? And, you know, I just love this, this uh, young girl's expression, and, you know, just to think, that's what our 3D printers are going to be used for, is to build, you know, dollhouse furniture or model railway uh, uh, of villages. Um, but it does suggest that this simple l level of What's fun about this and how we can use this? In Rome, I saw these were makers using marble dust to turn, uh, to create a material with resin and marble dust that was, had the sheen and, and hardness of, of marble, but in something they could print. And marble, is a, is something, marble dust is something that's left over after you cut marble and goes into streams, and so they thought it would be a good idea if they could collect it. And then you have fun things like people 3D printing with Nutella. And people using 3D printers to create exoskeletons for robots. And perhaps one of the most serious applications is 3D printing for prosthetics. And um, while you, know, you and I may not want that kind of hand, this guy doesn't have a hand, and he's interested in having his own hand, something that he can make himself and be part of a community, and you know, a, quite a growing community of people who want certain things from prosthetics that they may not get from a standard manufacturer. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go through this a little bit fast. And this is, I just came back yesterday from China, and we had a Maker Fair in Shenzhen. And it was the first sort of large Maker Fair in China. And uh, it really was kind of a kickoff of the Maker movement in China, almost a recognition and celebration of it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there were signs and robots all over. Um, and... Uh, uh, I ran into uh, Zach Smith, the MakerBot co-founder, who when he had gone to China to learn how to, uh, to investigate manufacturing for uh, the MakerBot, he decided to stay there. Um, and he, he now uh, is a co-partner -par in a, an accelerator called Hackcelerator, um, where they help companies develop. And, you know, if you don't know Shenzhen, just briefly, it is like the manufacturing capital of the world for electronics. Um, it has the greatest concentration of uh, sort of an ecosystem for manufacturing. And makers around the world are going to Shenzhen just because they can do stuff easily, um, more easily than they can, say, in America. This young man organized Maker Faire. This is Eric Pan from Seed Studios, and he's standing behind some of the products and, and boards they make. He came to Shenzhen in uh, and, and uh, started the business as an apartment in 2008. He has 160 employees. They manufacture things. They take ideas from makers from around the world and help them make stuff. Um, Seed Studio. 
These are just kind of a suitcase display of some of their, their products. And these are some of the makers there. This, uh, these were actually high school students that had a robotic hand that could, would remotely control another, uh, a robotic hand. So um, th this, uh, uh, the kids were doing well. And one of the things they talked about there was the convergence of the two forces in Shenzhen, the global maker movement, and something called Shanzai, which is sort of the spirit of Shenzhen to copy and, and make things there. And here's what I want to tell you if you're, if you're thinking about doing a Kickstarter. That there's a good chance if you're doing a Kickstarter, before your Kickstarter is funded, someone has taken your design, modified it, manufactured it, and got it to market before the, your Kickstarter even ended. Right? And it's going to take you another year once you get that funding to get that thing made yourself because you have to figure out all these processes. And it's not so much that they're stealing ideas, they're hungry for ideas. And they just have the capacity to be able to do them fast and efficiently. Lastly, I want to say that if, if you are thinking of developing a product, think about developing a community as well. It isn't just the product you should focus on, it is that sense of community who will help you shape that product and tell you what it is. And I think that is, in the end of the day, the value of the maker community. And whether we call ourselves creative or geek or enthusiast or maker, there's a common citizenship of all creative work. Um, quote by Walter Gropius of the Bauhaus. So um, it really doesn't matter where we're coming from and how we do it and what we call ourselves. We're all connected somehow. Thank you very much. Thank you. you did an amazing job of um, really convincing us that you enjoy your guests. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know that we've got questions for you, um, and so I'm now um, inviting um, audience members um, to ask questions. Um, what we do around here is we give priority to students. Um, sure. So um, do we have questions here? Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm a member of the computer science community here. Um, so I associate myself with the hacker culture slash maker culture. Um, and I really respect the work that you do. So thank you so much for thank that. Um, one of the things I've noticed, though, is that there is, there is a priority on building something and making something rather than, um, I guess, some more subjective elements like um, the, the aesthetics of it or the usability of it. How important do you think those, those things are to a successful or a useful product? Is it more important to focus on just making it or to actually making it something that's hol yeah. uh, holistically nice? Yeah. Well, I, th I think it's, it's a great question. And, and uh, I, I think if, uh, if there is somewhat of a weakness in makers, it's often design and a design process. Um, but I will have to say at the same time, there's a weakness in designers of sometimes over-processing things and not just building things to learn from them. And there's a, there's a, you can work both ways. And, and I, think, uh, it I think these are personal processes, personal choices. Uh, one of the things you can do today is create prototypes quickly and learn from them by, by having people use them rather than just having paper, uh, ideas on paper or ideas in your head. And that's, that seems very useful to me. But I, I think uh, uh, there's certainly room uh, for all of us to, to improve uh, you know, the aesthetics, the, the usability of things. But we, we, I, I don't know that we'll decide those just off in a room by ourselves. I think interacting with people and, and each working with different people of different skills is, is one of the ways we can do that. Um, but I, I think what I argue for, particularly in education, is sometimes we leave the making part off of the exercise. We do the design work, and then we kind of let that, let that go. Yes, sir? Yeah. OK. Yes, sir. What I wanted to know is how many people here have ever made things that they use every day? I mean, that's, I think there's, there's something about when you go to making something, you know, that it has value to it. And, and the problem that I've seen a lot of communities that make things, they don't make things that they use. Like, uh, I'll just show you an example, one right here, just so you can, one that is, uh, this is a, a, just a simple thing. 
It's an LED flashlight in which you can charge up by turning a crank. It uses uh, supercapacitors. And this thing has allowed me to reduce my electric utility bill. It's always been like down to about $25 a month because I don't use extraneous amount of lighting. Um, but the, the, and then I use LED lighting. With it. But yeah. the whole idea is what, where, where might I find a place where people make things that they use every day or once a week? I mean, because things have value. Hey. Yeah, I, that's a great point. Um, uh, some people uh, do that. Um, others, others um, you know, uh, create something cool that, that works once and they show it to people. Uh, there, there are different styles of it. I think, uh, although I think, you know, some of my analogy of making is cooking and things like becoming a better you know, cook day to day is just about uh, caring about that process and what you do. So I do think that uh, um, uh, sometimes we can sort of find that spot between making out of necessity and making for pleasure, uh, you know, right down the middle there. Anyone else? I think we have one right here. Okay. So you talked about, you talked about open source and open source hardware. Um, and you talked a little bit, you mentioned the pros and cons of it. I was wondering if you could tell us your personal opinion on that. You know, we are all makers. We're going to yeah. go out soon and make things. Yeah. What do you think we should do? Well, I think, a, a good question. Uh, you know, I talk to, sometimes I see the old world of inventors. And, and, and they come from a world that things are very proprietary and secretive. And they tend to hold on to things. And, and... If it works for you, fine. But there's there. What I think making the maker community has set as a default option is sharing, um, putting things out and getting feedback on. It. And there are benefits from that. Meaning you meet other people, your ideas, you know, are influential, uh, uh, and and, uh, and perhaps something happens with them. Uh, I think though everyone should understand it's their own choice what they do there. They are not. They shouldn't be uh, feel that they have to make everything free. Um, I, I think I use Bree's example as someone who changed mid-course uh, as a problem. Um, but I think we're Bree's not alone. There's other people that are trying to deal with that. Uh, um, once you get sort of once you've raised money and you get commercial backing, the rules do tend to change on you, and it can be hard. But I think the benefits of sharing and and the openness that comes from that. Um, have, uh, in a lot of ways, caused the maker movement to grow and I think even create business opportunities that couldn't have existed if, if it was not open that way. Is this a question here? Do you think that this maker movement makes both experts and beginner makers uh, make things more responsibly? Or... Or do we lose something in that process of doing it on our own? Do we lose something of the learning process that makes us think, that makes us make things responsibly? Okay. Well, responsibly is, has its context. But I'll try, I mean, I think people, people of any level are, one of the reasons we make is to learn how to make. And, and I think people are, are fascinated by that. I, mean, I think it's, it's why I was interested in the topic in the magazine. Everything was, was just, hey, I'd like to learn how to make cheese. I've never made it before. Am I going to be as good as someone who makes cheese every day or as a craftsman or an artisan? No, but I could actually respect what they do more and understand it a lot better. Um, and it doesn't, um, you know, in a sense, it doesn't work against them, I, I believe. Um, so I, I think just, again, using the cooking analogy, I think the fact that there are more, probably more better cooks in America today, not, most of them are not chefs. You know, most of them are, are cooking at home, uh, are cooking for uh, a party. And that's how I view makers. And I think they're, that I, I, you know, I don't, I don't exactly know where you draw the line on responsibly, but I think it's the responsibility to be producers is a pretty important one and not just, you know, go out and buy things all the time. Um, that we don't need. And, and I think often what I'm getting at there is, is that making creates meaning in the things that, that you're creating. It goes back to the value question he's asking at. And, and maybe we, we could use less if we had more meaning in the things that, that we own. Okay, well, one last question over there. Uh-oh, Eric. All right, 
<laughs> who, who doesn't need a microphone? Shout it out. Uh, so thank you so much. I actually, yeah. I'm really appreciative of you sharing the, this kind of framework. I like those old pictures of you too. <laughs> My question is actually, I mean, if I could bring it home for a minute. I mean, we're, we're in the academy now, right. and, and sort of, uh, in some sense, a lot of the excitement is being developed um, outside of the academy. I don't know what role uh, the university particularly plays with a culture like Berkeley yeah. that really has been sort of a public institution. If there's ways that you could, as an outsider, critique yeah. and give us some, some vision and guidance. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, partially, I, I do think there's a lot to what I hope today is just encourage everyone, whether you're in an academy or not, to, to this idea of adventure. Making is, is something you should just undertake as your own path forward, as your own idea of what you could do, whether you're Brie Pettis or me or someone else. Um, I think the idea of, of more open-ended uh, 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 participation in, in school, uh, like, like in a makerspace, and, and uh, the examples I've seen um, where we start embedding some of that in a facility and, and, and allowing people on campus to come together you know, to make things, uh, regardless of whether they're in the engineering department or in an architecture department or in a social studies department, to create a culture and a community of people who come together because they love doing this not because they're required to do it in that particular course. That's what I, I would try to at least find a place for that kind of uh, experience in school. Well, thank you. Actually, thank you. That, that's, that's a perfect cue for a commercial for the groundbreaking <laughs> for the Jacobs Institute on Saturday. So thank you for setting that Very up. Good. <laughs> um, Dale, this has been a fascinating okay, talk. Okay, thank you. Um, you started off by saying that you weren't an engineer, <laughs> but you have conveyed a huge um, number of sort of the, the qualities that we see and enjoy in engineers, um, the joy yes. of creating um, the ingenuity. And um, I can tell that you really enjoy giving back to yeah. people, which yeah. is one of the things that I think really drives engineers. Yes. They want to do cool things, but do it for society. Yes. So um, as a memento of um, this occasion, um, you said you weren't an engineer. <laughs> However, you but now you are like with all the engineering <laughs> swag. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rob. And I know that I'm not the only one who now wants to go and tell Dale about some of the things that I've made. <laughs> um, I know that lots of you will want to do this. And so we have some refreshments outside. And I invite everybody to um, take the opportunity to talk to Dale. I'm sure he's going to want to hear about what you've been making um, or anything else as well. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>